Uh, it's been been a great morning so far. Let's see. So we've got uh, we've had uh, appearances by Boy George, Prince, Monkeys, Batman, and the Ghostbusters. So I am I can, I'm waiting to see what Tom brings. Uh, Tom Webster's up next. I am I am a huge data junkie, so I, I'm super pumped to uh, to see what he's got to say about uh, drowning in data and, and how to help us out. So Tom, thank you. Uh, I am on the Twitters at Webby2001. Here's the hashtag for this talk if you want to use it. Um, I got into social media for probably a lot of the same reasons that you do. I love social media. I love interacting with people online. I love the, the networking. I, I love everything that social networking and social media has brought, despite the fact that it is incredibly harmful for your health. Now, despite the harm that it apparently causes us, here we see it's linked to teenage drinking and drug use, I continue to enjoy things like Facebook <laughs> and Twitter. By the way, this particular headline on Fox News, Facebook linked to teenage drinking and drug use. Do you know the percentage of teens in this country who use Facebook? It's 80. Facebook isn't the problem. <laughs> we live in an age of big data. We live in an age of data as content. And with that comes some dangers, some opportunities, but certainly a lot of caveats and things to look out for. We see so much of this bombarded, we retweet it. There's almost too much of it to keep up with. There's almost too much of it to vet and think about appropriately. And what I want to do today is help you think about some of this a little bit better so that you can be a more discerning consumer of the things that will actually help your brand. Three things that really clobber us today in social media. Number one are lousy headlines. This is a lousy headline. This study really doesn't prove this or say this, but the headline is designed to do one thing. The headline is not designed to help you build your business. The headline is not designed to help drive insight. The headline is designed for you to click on it and drive a page view, right? So this headline, social media engagement drives customer loyalty, high spending. Uh, the study that it relates to does say something interesting. I'm gonna fix the headline for you there. So there's a lot of problems with the headlines, certainly, in some of these things. There's a lot of, besides lousy headlines, there's crappy correlations, right? This, this particular, version of crappy correlation is not, is not designed to help you. In fact, it will actively hurt you if you don't do the work yourself to see if this means anything for your brand. These kinds of, well, there's a lot of tweets that have a lot of clicks, therefore you have to have a lot of links and you do it at 8 a.m. and you know, None of this stuff really means all that much until you do the work to prove it. And in fact, it can actively hurt your brand. And the other sort of pet peeve of mine that we're lousy with are infographics. I'm gonna give you a minute on this one. No one is immune to this sort of thing. No one is immune to this sort of thing. Infographics were meant originally to simplify complex data so you can understand it. That is not what they do now. By the way, do you know who invented the pie chart? This is one of my favorite stories. Does anybody know who invented the pie chart? Not Sarah Lee. Nobody doesn't like her. <laughs> she did not invent the pie chart. The inventor of the pie chart was Florence Nightingale, who was a hell of a statistician, a legitimate bona fide statistician and a nurse. She took an enormous amount of complex data from the Crimean War, and she designed pie charts. She designed, this is something called a coxcom chart. This chart shows the relationship between soldiers in battle who died in the battlefield due to their wounds in pink, and those that died much later due to infections and maladies from poor treatment on the battlefield. When the British government saw this, they had no choice but to revamp everything they do on the battlefield. It was basically the reason why we have battlefield hospitals to improve the chances that soldiers would survive when they were taken off the field of battle. This infographic saved lives. This infographic will cost lives eventually. I'm convinced of it. Thank you for making the smaller number the bigger circle. <laughs> we live in an age now where data is being presented as content. I don't know how many birds there equals 100 followers or 500 followers, I don't know. But these are not designed to simplify complex relationships. They are designed to make you click on them. They are designed as content. Data being presented to you as content is not very helpful. But we're being seduced by the age of big data. There's never been more data before us. There's crap tons of data. There's pant loads of data. Those are technical terms which I throw around <laughs> wildly. We have an enormous amount of data being thrown at us. And because there's so much of it, because we're deluged with all of the data that we could access, we're seduced by it. We think that all of these numbers, this 
huge mass of data, it must mean something. It must be better than what we had before. That's not always the case. More is not always better, now that I've prefaced that. Which would you have more faith in, a survey of 2 million people or a survey of 20 people? 2 million. 2 million, right? Which do you think the world loves more, chocolate or this guy? <laughs> I will give you the results of two surveys. 2 million adult males, 18 to 34, say beloved leader. <laughs> 20 kindergartners have the right answer, right? It's about who you talk to, not the numbers. And of course, the other thing that rules our lives now, and this is something I want to write more and more about in the coming weeks and months on my blog, we're being ruled by algorithms. And there's a tendency to view an algorithm as a formula, an algorithm as, algorithm, yo, an algorithm as math. An algorithm is not math. An algorithm is math plus assumptions. There are humans that make assumptions about how all of those numbers go together, right? And an algorithm has a tremendous amount of human input. That's why my clout page looks like a very bad road trip. <laughs> <laughs> Nausea, pregnancy. <clears throat> now, all of this has made me, admittedly, a little cranky. <laughs> But I'm here to help and shine a light, and hopefully shine a light for you as well, and not necessarily to critique, but to give you some things to think about, to help you parse all of this that's coming towards you, and actually make it work for you. Because again, things that are designed now in content out there are not designed necessarily to help your business. They are data as content. They're data that is designed to bring page views, or traffic, or leads to the people that are presenting to you. And that's not always the case but it's often the case. So, the three things we're gonna talk about today are to know what you don't know. Super important in my business. I am, uh, by trade, a market researcher. I look at primary data, I look at secondary data, I look at big data, clickstream data that we get from our clients, and I synthesize it together so that I can provide my clients with simple, actionable insights. The first thing I always need to do is to know what I don't know. Second thing, ask better questions. There's almost no worse thing in the world of social media data that we get thrown at us than the attempts to answer bad questions. And, and finally, to do your own work. So I'm gonna talk first of all about knowing what you don't know. Now again, because we have so much clickstream data being thrown at us, we are seduced into believing that we have all of the answers in front of us. We just need to mine through eight million clicks. We just need to mine through 50,000 tweets. It's more data than we've ever had. But the unknown sits there, nevertheless, calmly licking its chops. Or in the words of my favorite American poet, certainly one of the two or three greatest American poets ever, Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> there are known knowns, there are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know now, we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. These are things we do not know, we do not know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I also perform at poetry slams. <laughs> Now, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a little bit of insight into this, into knowing what you don't know. Here is something that was published in Mashable. More on Mashable in a moment. Social media has little impact on online retail purchases. Study in brackets. Social media has little impact on online retail purchases. Now, I read this study. It was entirely derived from clickstream data. Where did you click before you bought something, right? Your big winners here, of course, were search. Search was a very big winner. And social had, I think, less than 1% in terms of attribution somewhere in the clickstream to this data. I travel a lot in my job. I do mostly client work. I travel, <coughs> next week I'm going to Zurich. I'm driving to Basel. I'm, I'm, I travel a lot. I travel about 125 to 150,000 miles a year. It's important for me to have really good luggage because I go through bags all of the time, especially laptop bags fail me a lot. Here's a bag I bought. I brought it with me. I, brought this, I bought this bag from a company called Waterfield. I'm not paid. Or I get no joy or pleasure from this whatsoever, other than as an example. I bought this bag in the year 2000. This bag is 11 years old. This is a hell of a bag. Now, you've seen this bag. If I go on Twitter and I talk about this bag, and you say, that's a hell of a bag. Where'd you get it? 
I say, I got it from Waterfield Bags. And you go, you Google Waterfield Bags, you go to Waterfield, and you buy it. The clickstream shows that you went to Google. But you learned about this from social. This is what you don't know. This is what clickstream data doesn't know and does not tell you. But they are knowable unknowns. To again, paraphrase the great <laughs> Donald Trump stuff. <laughs> Another thing about what we don't know, and this is a super important point to me. Uh, my company, Edison Research, one of the things that we are best known for, we're the sole providers of all the exit polling data for all of the metrics. So, for instance, here in Tennessee, when during your primary, all of the data that came in, regardless of what channel you watched, actually came from us. The channels presented themselves, they made holograms, they made magic maps, they do all that. Uh, we just make sure that the numbers are right. Um, and doing the exit polls is actually, it's, a, it's an enormously complicated job. It is filled with the things we do not know and correcting for those things, right? How many of you voted in the last presidential election? Raise your hand. Okay, about 20% of you are lying. <laughs> How many of you, if you were asked by an exit pollster upon leaving a precinct to take an exit poll, would do it? Some of you are also not telling the truth, but we know that. When someone leaves the precinct and does not take an exit poll, this is a thing we do not know. But what we do is we look at them, we say, all right, there is a male, 18 to 34, Caucasian who did not vote. We record that. We record what we miss. We record what we don't know. So we go back, and one of the 11 or 12 models that we look at when we are actually trying to see what is going on in the precinct, we look at who didn't vote. We then can weight that data and calibrate it accordingly. We know what we don't know. We know who didn't vote. We know who did vote and why. So we can add all that stuff into the model, right? The day of our very first caucus this year, the Iowa caucus, Mashable ran this. Twitter indicator, could Trump polls for 2012 election measurement? Mashable Mad Lib, make any wild headline you want, insert the word could, and run it. <laughs> This came out uh, the day of the Iowa caucus. Twitter indicator could Trump polls for the 2012 <laughs> election measurement. Uh, here was the Twitter indicator in question the morning of the Iowa caucus. Uh, they measured things like mentions, sentiment. Uh, number one, by nearly five, well, by more than five times the closest competitor with Republicans here was Ron Paul with 227,600 mentions. It was also number one in sentiment. Uh, number two, Barack Obama. We were able to predict that he won the Democratic caucus in Iowa. <laughs> number three, uh, Newt Gingrich, and then Mitt Romney was fourth, but he was even lower in sentiment. And number five was Rick Perry. Who won the Iowa caucus? Rick Santorum won, right? Does not even show, does not even show up. Why? Because here's what that Twitter indicator does not know, and does not know that it does not know. What is the correlation between somebody tweeting about a candidate, even tweeting favorably about a candidate, and the number of people who will walk to an elementary school and cast a vote. I'm going to give you the formula for that. It's complicated. <laughs> Until someone proves otherwise, there's no repeatable correlation for an individual based on that data. There just is. There's just way too many unknowns. Will that be solved someday? It may be solved someday. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Luddite. I, I, this is the data that I work with every day. But one of the reasons why it has very little correlation. This is something that came out from Pew the week of the Iowa caucus. Where do people get campaign information? Twitter was at the bottom of both of those lists. Where people getting campaign information online, largely from CNN, Yahoo News, Google News, Fox News, right? That's where people are getting the information. There's very little overlap, actually, between where people get campaign information and Twitter. Now, that may change. Twitter is very important for other things, which I've certainly written about uh, on my blog. I'm not trying to denigrate or demonize Twitter here. But there just is not yet any kind of correlation between this data and actual election data. Now, why am I harping on this? Imagine, if you will, replace the names and faces of these candidates with brands, with products. Imagine if you are the lunchtime sponsor, Bush's Baked Beans, and you replace the names of those, the names of those politicians with brands of beans, your competitors. You get that information back from Bean Scan or something. <laughs> and you see some kind of ranking of sentiments and mentions and things like that. You don't know what to do with that yet because you don't know what you don't know. Now, what you will be able to do from looking at social media, and I'm convinced of this, 
Social media is superb at giving you better questions. Giving you better questions. I've already given you one better question, which is what is the relationship between people who tweet about a candidate online and their propensity to go and vote? That's an answerable question. That will be answered someday. That's a better question. Answering and asking better questions, though, will lead you to a better understanding of social. One of my favorite market research anecdotes of all time, an enormously, and I know market research anecdotes are riveting, kids, but <laughs> work with me. An enormously popular launch in this country many years ago was the launch of Lexus. Now, when Lexus came into this country, it was dominated by especially the German luxury brands, and even Cadillac was still, uh, there were some, some American luxury brands were doing well. Lexus entered this market, and they did a lot of market research. They did a lot of the traditional market research, such as how many cylinders would you like your car to have? How many airbags should your car have? You know, I mean, kind of feature kind of stuff. But they also asked better questions. Everyone is going to tell you that they want all of the features and, and gadgets they can get on a luxury car. But what Lexus did when they launched in this country was they actually shadowed around some executives in their target, people who lived in McMansions with significant exurban commutes, right? They lived way out in large houses in suburbs, drove into city, into urban jobs, had enormously stressful lives. They followed them around, and they tried to find out what can we do to make their lives better, not should they get eight cylinders or six. I don't know, maybe seven, what's the difference? They followed them around to try to make their lives better. And one word came out of that research. What these executives, men and women, affluent, significant exurban commutes, wanted most was some peace and quiet. They wanted peace and quiet. Lexus launched in this country with one word, quiet. They did not launch on luxury, Caribbean leather. They didn't launch on that. They launched on quiet. That was everything that they focused on. And they brought it back. This is a brand new campaign. I show you this for two reasons. Number one, it's one of my favorite anecdotes for asking better questions. Number two, I've had a thing for Kylie Minogue since 1980. <laughs> Asking better questions. What can my product do to make your life better? What is the problem I can solve? Not what features do you need? Because people don't necessarily have that kind of vocabulary. But this was an excellent question. I'll give you another example. Frosted Flakes. If you use social media monitoring and you collect a bunch of stuff about Frosted Flakes, you will get people telling you things about Frosted Flakes. Right? You'll get people telling you that it's, it's sweet, or it's too crunchy, or it's not crunchy enough. It goes soggy in milk, it, it, it's great in milk. Uh, or they might be telling you that it, I saw some of these, I actually did some research on this as I was going through using a, a social media monitoring platform. And there were a whole bunch of people that said, it tears up the roof of my mouth. To which I would say, don't eat Captain Crunch ever. <laughs> now, you could just take that data and say, we've got a problem. We've got a roof of the mouth problem, Kellogg's. We've got to address this. Well, what you've got is a better question. You've got a question that you can then go back and test with some other form of research. Ask some Frosted Flakes customers, is this really a problem, or did we just hear this? And this is what social media is fantastic at. Social media alone will never give you the answers. It will give you better questions. It will give you a lot better questions. It's the world's greatest focus group in a lot of ways. I've really come to see that. So, it will give you better questions, which you can then test. The mistake that a lot of uh, the social media data that is put out there, especially data for content purposes, makes is it takes the first pass as the answer and not as the question. It doesn't make any effort to test those assumptions. It just takes that data as, look, here's the answer, right? And you never know what you'll find if you continue to ask better questions. I dug around in Frosted Flakes. And I found in the category, there were all these mentions of people eating cereal for dinner. Now, I thought there were only three reasons why you would eat cereal for dinner. You are lazy, you are cheap, or you are drunk. <laughs> but actually, as I dug around a little bit, I discovered there was this sort of off-brand usage for bad clickers. There was an off-brand usage, essentially, for cereal that uh, involved weight loss, that involved uh, diet, basically. How people would eat cereal because they were trying to lose some weight. Boy, did I just have a serious crash, but I'm gonna keep going anyway. So, that gives you a better question to ask, right? That gives you the question to ask. I wonder if there is a market here for people eating cereal for dinner. I wonder if this is a behavior that a lot of people share. 
I wonder if this is something that I actually really need to look at, eating cereal for dinner, right? Now, Kellogg's looked into this with other forms of research. They tested their assumptions, and they discovered that there was, in fact, a market for potentially eating cereal for dinner. They didn't apply that to Frosted Flakes. They applied it to a whole brand extension for Special K. Right? Special K went from an incredibly soggy cereal, <laughs> if you've ever had Special K. I, and I do apologize. I just had a complete crash here, so I'm going to try to fix this while I'm talking. They had a, a complete line based around this, right? a complete line of cereals and other products that are brand extended for Special K as a diet product. They discovered they got a good question out of some of their other research, and they tested that question and asked a better question and got some more results out of it. Uh, I do apologize. I have got to absolutely do something here, or I'm just not going to be able to go on. Had a complete, complete crash. So um, I have got another copy of my presentation, and I'm going to quickly put it on the other laptop. I don't know what happened there, but. Yeah, I'm getting the. Uh, the giant spinning beach ball of death on now. Who would do that to my precious Mac? Give me the spinning beach ball of death. Uh, I'll take some questions. Sure, I've got, I've got one more big section to go. It's the best, most awesome section. Um, but as the end always is. Um, yeah, if you guys have some questions for Tom, I've uh, uh, been following the, uh, on Twitter. Uh, I think you have, you have like uh, 15 new man crushes now, Tom. Lots of, lots of guys in the audience. Um, Super. Love it, love it on you. All right, uh, I've got to... <laughs> Wow, what, I, I, this is a Jay's complete gonna... serious beach ball of death crash, so I'm... Uh, Tom Webster. Hello. Hello, Jay. Thank you for saving me. So, you're talking about using social chatter data to find better questions. That's Would right. you say, then, that the people in charge of social data mining in an organization should not be community manager types, but more so statistical analysis, market research types. Because what we see now is a lot of people who use listening platforms are more on the customer service, community manager, sort of soft skills side, and less on right. the get me a spreadsheet side. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to our opening keynote today, and, I, and I'm going to say you need to break down those silos. I think uh, Mark and I have had this conversation. Mark Schaefer, uh, Mark and I have had this conversation before about the skills that uh, tomorrow's job candidates are going to need to have. And certainly, some facility with statistics, some facility with numbers is going to be crucial, some facility with analytics. Uh, but I think there has to be a lot more communication between the community managers and the analytics folks so they're not farmers and cowmen, right? There shouldn't be farmers and cowmen. Uh, they both have lots to learn from each other. I'm a statistics guy, but uh, my, you know, yes, I do have an advanced degree in, in what I do. I do have a background in it. I also have two degrees in English Lit. And so when people say to me, I'm no good with numbers, that bothers, that's something that's always bothered me a little bit. I'm no good with numbers. To me, that's like saying I'm no good with words. It comes across the same way with me, right? So I think we at least have a responsibility in, with community managers to not use that as a crutch, and with the statisticians to not cloak their wizardry in the impenetrable language and jargon of our craft, right? To break down those silos, and I, I think that's uh, a super point that our opening speaker brought up, certainly. And it's one that I would echo here. And I will take one more stall-worthy question while I, I open up this it's presentation. Inter who here, so who here identifies themselves as a community manager, social media manager, something of that sort? Um, not, well, not that many. And how many of you actually actively are looking at some type of monitoring, analytics, following through, no, of, of not just, of the social media manager? Like if you're a social media, if you actually engage in conversation and you look at analytics, put your hand up high. Okay, that's, that's promising, that's really good. And then we've also learned about Tom, not only is he smart, but he's also an overachiever with how many degrees? Uh, three, but two of them suck. Okay, <laughs> so if you're, if you're an English major, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Tom, Tom will continue. <laughs> Hello, welcome, we're back online. Thank you, thank you. My laptop is still the spinning beach ball of death. If you have a Mac, you know it. I don't know why, it's just like PowerPoint just went a rod, so to speak. Okay, a little bit more on asking better questions. And now the entertainment value is gonna pick way up because my technical problems are sorted. There is a special place in hell 
for this kind of research. When is the best time to publish blog posts? What? I'm going to tell you why there's a special place in hell for that. Number one, I'm going to dispense with it statistically in about two minutes. But number two, it is not designed to help your business. It is designed for lead generation. It is designed for content cre creation purposes. You need to test this stuff on your own. You need to find out, is this applicable to my list? What time should I be sending to my list, or does time even matter? So when this sort of research comes out, I, a little part of me dies. A unicorn gets stabbed by a puppy. <laughs> Two scatter plots. Which one is more random? Which one is more random? Shout it out. How many people think the left? How many people think the right? Random numbers clump. Random numbers clump. That's why it's so difficult to isolate cancer clusters in this country. If you just plot cancer cases on a map, you will see clusters and you will think, there's a problem there. Right? If you do this on a map, you will see a big cluster of cancer in Bangor, Maine. Bangor, Maine was once known as a leading provider of shoes. There are still a lot of shoe stores in Bangor. Shoes cause cancer. <laughs> Random numbers clump. Okay? You have to test to find out, is that clumping by accident, or is that clumping because of a correlation with something? I want to actually bring an example here. This is my third wife, Nellie. <laughs> Before Nellie's tragic accident, uh, she, was, she was quite a shooter. And uh, she's going to demonstrate something for me. This is a, a little piece of statistical knowledge that I think you'll enjoy. If Nellie takes a shotgun and Nellie starts blasting away at the side of a truck, this is what it's probably going to look like. Shotgun pellets come out at random. It's going to look something like this. Okay? This is random. The fallacy here, and it is actually called, in my line of work, the Texas shotgun fallacy, is to then draw a target and then, oh, there I hit it. <laughs> that is the Texas shotgun fallacy. Oh, there I hit it, right? But here's the worst part. The question is not what day is the best day to tweet. The question is whether or not time or date has anything to do with success. It may, it may not, you don't know. It's been assumed. It. The goal of this sort of work to say what's the best time of day to, to tweet, what's the best time of day to tweet or the best time to send an email goes into it with the presumption that it matters, goes into it with the presumption that there must be a time function to the success of my Twitterness. But that's not been proven, that's not been tested, right? That's not science. What science is, is to come at something with a hypothesis and then try to prove it wrong. I wonder if time has a function with the success of my tweets. I wonder if time has a function or day of the week has a function with the success of my blog posts. You then perform some controlled experiments to test that. If you find that it does, then you go back into your data, you do your own work, and you find those correlations for yourself. Science is about proving things wrong until you can't. Not about taking the first answer and running with it. So when you see data like this, that your links in a tweet should be somewhere in the first 30%, just remember it's grist for a content mill until you prove it otherwise. Until you go back and do the work yourself to determine, are those just random numbers that clumped, or is there in fact a meaningful correlation? But not just a meaningful correlation in general, a meaningful correlation for your brand, for your list, for your product. Data for content creation purposes is inherently incurious. In my line of work, incurious is a vile swear word. You will never get a job in my company if you are incurious. Data for content creation is inherently incurious. And finally, do your own work. And this is where I think we all have an opportunity to do a little bit better. Not all of the data we see, including the data that I just showed you, the best day and time to tweet, not all of it's bad. Some of it might be good. I'm not going to throw it all under the bus here. I'm merely going to suggest that until you do your own work, you do not know whether or not it is meaningful for your brand or not. I'll give you an example. Why do you do your own work? You do your own work for two reasons. Number one, you will get in trouble if you don't. But number two, if you don't do your own work, if you cheat, you might get through the school year, you might, get out of, you might get through the quarter, but when you leave school, you will be dumb. You will be smart when you do your own work. You will be smart about your own brand, about your own data, if you do your own work. And what they did here was they set it against USA Today's ad meter. Now, USA Today's ad meter is, is kind of a crappy poll. I mean, it, it's, anybody can vote on it. You're not sure where they came from, necessarily. 
Uh, but it is certainly a little bit different than mining for tweets and, and mining for things from social media. Uh, the way that the USA Today ad meter is done, the social business index was smart, I think, to attack it because it's, it's not that great of a poll. It's a people poll, it's not incredibly representative. As a result of that, this article came out as a result of this particular piece of work, how social media is making polling obsolete, right? Now, I somewhat take umbrage to this. I'll get to this in a minute. I use both. I'm tool agnostic. I use social media listening. I use polling. I use survey. I use everything I can in my toolkit to get the best insight from my customers. One of the things I don't like about articles like this is the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning. How many people remember this from school? Deductive versus inductive reasoning, right? Here's deductive reasoning. All zebras have stripes. Here's a zebra. Therefore, it has stripes. That's good. Inductive reasoning is this. All zebras have stripes. This one has stripes. Therefore, it's a zebra. That's inductive reasoning. What we saw in this particular uh, work on the, on the Super Bowl was this. Ad meter is a poll. Ad meter is crappy. Therefore, polls are crappy. Ding. Right? That's inductive reasoning. Or what we call in my business a straw man. But here's the thing. Listening is not going to kill asking. Listening is going to make asking stronger. Asking is going to make listening stronger. Saying that listening is going to kill asking, saying that mining tweets is going to kill asking your customers questions is like saying hammers are going to kill wrenches. I use hammers and wrenches in my job, right? Listening is not going to kill asking. It's going to make it stronger. Now, about doing your own work. This particular piece of research using the Social Business Index looked at all of the tweets, all of the Facebook posts that they could access, everything from social media, to get a sense of which ads were doing better. They plotted those ads here, and the, the dots that are scattered across are a direct comparison to the USA Today ad track, right? This alone is a little sort of subtle piece of infographia that uh, helps you see that their data comes in a nice straight line. And look at the USA Today data. It's all over the place, right? Uh, <laughs> But this is what they did. They provided all of these brands, and they plotted them against, directly in opposition to USA Today, to show, look, look how much they're wrong, right? They agreed on the number one, which is Doritos, but they agreed very few other places. Now, first thing I like to do when I see a piece of research like this is I like to check the methodology. First thing you should always do when you see a study is check the methodology. Who was asked? How were they asked? How was the sample obtained? Right? When was it? When was the survey conducted? Find out all those things. This is a methodology statement. This is the methodology statement from the Pew research I showed you earlier. Right? I can read this. If I read this and do exactly what they did, and I replicate what they did 95 times out of 100, 95 times out of 100, I will get their same answers within a couple of points. Right? That's what a methodology is used for. Methodology on this, this particular Super Bowl study is this. Rankings were determined based on the same time frame as AdMeter using data from the Social Business Index, which benchmarks the social performance of 30,000 brands. Here it is in a nutshell. Our methodology is that we used our methodology. <laughs> it's impenetrable. It's a black box. So I, I don't know what to make of it. There's so much I don't know about this data. You need to know what you don't know. Now, what's a good thing that you don't know here? I'll show you. Does anyone tweet about brands besides people who work in marketing, advertising, PR, or social media? That's a damn good question. I don't know the answer to that. It's a knowable unknown. It is something you need to know the answer to before you can parse the data that you get from social media. It is something that if you are a brand that is on that social business index, you need to know that answer for your brand. What are my customers doing? Where are my customers? Do they talk about my brand online? If they don't, if my customers and my potential customers aren't talking about my brand online, who is? And what weight do I apply to what they're saying? I need to apply some weight, but I need to apply a weight to it, is the point. How many of you drink beer? Mark, what's your favorite beer? St. Pauli. St. Pauli. Jay, I know, you, I know you like a beer now and then. What's your favorite beer? What is your favorite beer, and are you drinking it now? <laughs> West Coast IPA. DJ, what's your favorite beer? Bell's Oberon. I will tell you, my favorite beer is Bell's Two Hearted, also from the great state of Michigan, right? So I don't drink beer very often. I'm more of a gin than wine than gin than gin drinker. But I do like <laughs> the occasional beer. Now, I heard what I heard in here, 
I heard some import beers. I heard some craft beers, right? Amy, what's your favorite beer? Anything that's not hard. Michelob Ultra. Michelob Ultra. Okay, good answer. I like you. Um, I liked you anyway, but this solidified that feeling. That I, should. <laughs> I heard a lot of craft beers. I heard a lot of import beers. What's the number one beer in the country? Bud Light, that's right. And it's not by a little. It is number one by a pant load. It is number one. It has a 20% market share amongst beers in this country, 20% market share. Uh, the next two are in at like 8 or 9%, and they are also in varying degrees up and down, Coors and, and Budweiser. Bud Light has a 20% market share. Let's go back to this, the social business index. Number one here was Doritos. Here was Bud Light. Now, Bud Light was in the, at the beginning of the middle tier of what social media told us. It was number two with USA Today's ad track. There, that is an enormous disparity. But I ask you this. If you are the folks tweeting about the brands, I didn't hear anybody say Bud Light in here, right? That is a bias I need to know. That is a bias I need to know when I do my own work. I need to know, <laughs> are the customers that I have that are drinking my product the same ones that are tweeting about my product. If they are, great. If they are not, what is the disparity so I can weight that data and use it accordingly? There's no such thing as bad data. There is only how to use it and how to place it in context. If you rely too much on social media data without doing that kind of work, without determining where are my customers, what are my actual customers doing, what are my most likely potential customers doing, then you cannot make sense of the data that you get from social media. And if you don't understand why Bud Light is the number one beer in America, you are really saying this. I don't understand millions of people. It's the Bon Jovi argument. I say that all the time. I can't believe Bon Jovi is like, then you don't understand 50 million people. And when you are a marketer or when you are in my business, you need to understand 50 million people just as well as you understand your neighbors. Do your own work. Why it matters. Whew. I'll tell you why it matters. If I walk from here to that back door, I close my eyes and I just start walking. Let's, let's assume I get off the stage first so I don't end up in traction. If I close my eyes and start walking to that back door, I'll probably reach it, okay? If I am three degrees off, I'll probably hit the wall, might chip a tooth, but I, I'm probably pretty close to the door. I can find it. The distance is short. The amount of data between here and there is small. A small mistake, I will still find my way to the back door. Big data is different. When we have enormous quantities of data that we are looking at, and we make little assumptions about that data, and we're off by two or three percent. It's like taking off from a plane in Knoxville, flying to Zurich, where I'm going next week, which is known as the, as the Knoxville of Switzerland. <laughs> and by the time your plane runs out of gas, you are going to be in Fiji. Because the data is so big, the assumptions that you need to make, even if they're a little bit off, little tweaks, you're traveling so far with them, you could end up extraordinarily off course. So it's very important then to know what you don't know, to ask better questions, and to do your own work. Now, I have a little bit of time here for questions, and I'm happy to take them. But that's all I have for you today, and I hope you do all of these things. And by the way, thank you for being so kind uh, during my technical kerfuffle. Uh, it just, I've, it seems like something always happens like that to me at some point, and I, I just have to pee a little bit and, and move on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but thank so, you for that. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, time for questions. I got, um, but put your hands up and I'll, I'll walk over towards Amy here. Um, could, do you, are there, is there a good use of infographics ever? I mean, yes, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not, uh, let me make sure that I'm very clear about this. Infographics, as in the case of Florence Nightingale, are great, a great way for you to take enormously complex data, a giant data set that you've pulled some insights from and then summarizing that in a way that everybody in your executive team can instantly understand, that everybody in your group can get. It's about simplifying complex relationships in data, right? We have, there's a lot of infographics out there that are, that are pictures representing two numbers. Now, I could just be snarky and say, just give me the two numbers. But the purpose of these infographics, it's all about the intent. What is the intent of the infographic? The intent of the infographic is to simplify a complex relationship and make it crystal clear for me so I can gain actionable insights, then I love that infographic. If the, if the purpose of that infographic is 
to make a potentially iffy piece of data somewhat more attractive, or in the words of Marshall McLuhan, the polished turd, I'm not such a big fan. So I don't, I don't dislike infographics, I dislike crappy data that's been prettified. So, yeah. Okay, Tom, when you, when you get new business, do you uh, pitch or do you pitch yourself? Or are you in front of clients pitching yourself? Yes. Okay. Well, Is I'm pitching my company. I'm you, pitching yes, the quality of my, of my right. work, of course. Have you ever been rejected and, and why? Have you ever lost not getting some kind of uh, project? Because first of all, I can't imagine anyone not wanting to hire you. So that's, that's super kind of you. But I, I, so uh, we are a custom market research company. Right? We are a custom market research company, and typically what custom research is, is you come to me with a problem that you can't solve with freely available sources or with easily accessible secondary data. And sometimes that can be inexpensive, sometimes that can be very expensive. Sometimes a client will come to me with a problem that is well nigh intractable, and I will, I will discover a way to get that answer in a way that makes me able to sleep at night and gives them the actionable insight that they want. It might cost more than they're willing to spend. So that's certainly it. But you know, I, look, I, I, we get beat up all the time on pitches. I mean, we, we're we're just like an ad agency in that way. We compete against other market research agencies, and you know, we we do what we can do. But but thank you. So do you guys have stuff that you just publish, or is it all custom for clients? No, we do publish data. In fact, this week um, I published it on our website, on our blog at edisonresearch.com, and also on my blog at brandsavant.com backslash plug brackets. Um, that are some new public data that we've released on uh, social media adoption and, and how people are using social media today. And I'm going to be presenting a whole bunch of it publicly at Blog World in June. So if anyone's going to Blog World, you're going to get a whole uh, passel of data to drown in. Instead of telling you how not to drown in data, I'm going to drown you myself, personally. Uh, but I, this week, in fact, um, and I talked about this on Jay Bear's podcast, Social Pros, if you haven't heard that yet. Uh, this week, we showed a stat that showed the disparity between the number of Americans 12 plus who use Twitter, which is 10% up from uh, eight last year and seven the year before, and the number of Americans 12 plus, this is online and offline Americans, who are familiar with Twitter or have heard of Twitter, and that's about 90%, it's 89%. So there's this big disparity. So this year, we got to the bottom of that with some questions, and, and one of the most striking uh, things that we released uh, in this, one of the questions that really brought some insight to this was this. How often, we ask this again of all Americans 12 plus, how often do you hear about tweets or Twitter updates on other forms of media, television, radio, newspaper, or on other websites? The numbers we got back were shocking. Now again, keep in mind, 10% of Americans 12 plus use Twitter. This is a hard trackable number. I've been tracking this for five years, right? It's, the number is solid. The percentage of Americans who say they see tweets in the media or on other websites nearly every day was 44%. Over four in 10 Americans say they see something about tweets nearly every day. And the percentage of Americans 12 plus who say they've ever seen something about a tweet in the media is 80%, is 80%, right? That's an enormous number. That tells you that Twitter punches well above its weight, especially in terms of being a broadcast network. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of sharing our own data here, but I, you know, I, I love to freely admit when I'm surprised by a piece of data, and that is a piece of data that surprised me. That's an enormous number. It may not be uh, surprising to you because you're all using Twitter, you're all on Twitter, you're on the Twitter, you're so slamming the hashtag. <laughs> uh, but big numbers like that su surprise the heck out of me because let's not forget, Twitter is a brand, right? What brand does any American 12 plus hear about nearly every day? Not many. So that's a that's quite a that's quite a stat. But I don't I forget the original question and I thoroughly bulldozed right over. Yeah, Tom, I was wondering if you had any uh, analytical tools that you would suggest us use. Not everybody's a statistician. Uh, you could do a lot with Excel, honestly. I mean, I use something called SPSS, but that's what you pay me to do. Um, but uh, you can do a lot in Excel. It's actually you know you can if you if you have this bent or if you are a quant person, and you have not picked up statistics. Let me recommend you do that. If you are someone who is in web analytics or in, uh, or in any kind of quantitative capacity in your company, get yourself a, an intro stats book. There are intro stats books that teach statistics using Excel. And there are a lot of things you can do in Excel. You can do reasonable correlations in Excel. You can do, SPSS. what's that? Do you want SPSS? Is 
I do, I use a lot of SPSS. I'm not gonna use a lot of PowerPoint from this moment on. Um, but yeah, I, I, but you know, you can do a lot of this stuff in SPSS. It's more important to understand this, the difference between what uh, a statistician does and what someone who's in web analytics does is this. Someone who's in web analytics is able to take the census. They're able to look at the entire population of data. Someone who is in, uh, in statistics or in, in survey research looks at samples, right? Now samples, are, samples are kind of magic. Samples are the law. If you sample things correctly and you do a, a sample of 2,000 people properly done, that's gonna be right 95 times out of 100. And it's gonna be a lot easier to get information that you can't get from web analytics. But again, web analytics gives you the population, which is uh, the, the whole census of that data, which is very valuable and useful. But there are limits to both kinds of data, right? There are, there's always limits to both kinds of data. There's a limit to web analytics. I'll give you a piece of data you can't get through web analytics. If I tweet something right now, if I tweet, man, I'm having a great time at Social Slam. I'm so happy I'm keeping everybody from their lunch with this long-winded answer. <laughs> tweet. I know how many followers I have. I can count the retweets. Here's a piece of data that no web analytics package in the world will tell you. How many people read it? It's unknowable through web analytics. I might know how many times it was pushed onto a page. I don't know where on that page. Right? But I don't know how many people read it. I can't come up with an impression from that number. It's, an, it's, it's an unknowable unknown without some additional data beyond quickstream data. Uh, but yeah, tools, Excel. Honestly, you don't need much. Uh, there are other advanced tools, some you can get for free, but you don't need them. You know, if you've got, you got a seriously advanced problem, you need to call me. Uh, but if you don't, <laughs> Excel's gonna do it. Other questions? A very well presented and interesting talk. Can you cut to the bottom line and tell us who is going to win the November presidential election? Uh, I, I am contractually obligated to tell you that while we have indeed fixed it, that uh, I can't tell you who it is. No, I, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I can tell you that, uh, no, I can't. <laughs> It is, uh, you know, the exit polling is actually, it's, uh, I don't talk about it, if you, if you follow my tweets, I really don't talk about it at all. It's a sacred trust for us. It's the only source of data for Americans for who voted and why. There's no other source of that data. We take that enormously seriously. Chuck. Hey, uh, just one quick question, Tom. What, what do you see as market researchers' biggest aversion to unstructured data? I mean, they're slowly sort of coming yeah. into the fold because they see sort of the power, a lot of which you've highlighted here. Mm -hmm. um, but, how do you get those folks into the fold aside from you know, talking to them early? Well, one of the points that I made today that I hope really hit home was I think social media is awesome for getting better questions. Social media is fantastic for coming up with better questions, for seeing early warning signs, maybe this is a problem, right? It's not gonna tell you this is a problem with the predominance of my customers or some statistically significant set of my customers. It's gonna tell you you might have a problem and you should check it out. It's super for that. Um, to bring back farmers and cowmen again, uh, there's, I think, farmers and cowmen on both sides there with traditional market researchers and with web analytics folks. Web analytics folks look at traditional market researchers as stuck in surveys. Why do I need to ask 2,000 people when I've got 60 bajillion tweets, you know? Uh, there's that. And, and, and in a lot of cases, they're not wrong, right? Uh, and market researchers, you know, someone who's been in traditional survey research for a long time, this is a new skill for them. Right? And it's just, it's just what Jeannie talked about before. You can either entrench yourself or you can change. And to me, the change is not to throw out the old. It is to make the old better. It is to make the old a richer tool. And you know, I love doing qualitative research in social media. I do not make the mistake of treating it as quantitative. I think one of the things that market researchers cringe at is the presentation of mind data from social media as representative of anything. And so the there is a tendency amongst market researchers to then thoroughly reject it. That's completely unrepresentative. You have no idea who tweeted that. Okay, but it's not useless. It may, it may in fact have more use than you think if you do a little bit of work to calibrate it. You know, I mentioned earlier with the exit polls, we track who didn't, who ignored us, who did, who did we miss, who refused to take the exit poll so that we can fill in some of those gaps, the non-response bias. And if you can do a little bit of work to correct that non-response bias in social media, it becomes enormously valuable. But the, this farm is a comment on both sides. It's, all, it's about change, fundamentally. Are you cutting me off, Mark? I saw it. I saw it. 
We got, is there one more? Uh, I'm going to be waiting for your talk. Tom, hey, uh, there's a camera right here. Um, awesome. Give Tom another round of applause. Thank you. Very